You're listening to the Common Descent Podcast. Hi, David. Hello, Will. And hello, listeners. Hello, listeners. How's everybody doing today? I'm well. Good. All right. And so, he's Will. <laughs> I, I am Will. He's High Will. quality comedy here on the Common <laughs> oh, Podcast. Oh, man. The last time I heard that was, you know, yesterday. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's always funny when people first realize that my name's a word. And it's really fun for them, and it never bugs me, but we realized that when I was in first grade. (laughs) (laughs) So welcome, everyone, to episode 24, second to last episode of the year, everyone. Yes. So close. It is. Today's episode is, is, it's going to be a fun one. This is one that I've had my eye on doing for a little while, and it's a little weird because it's zooming in on a group a little bit further than we have up till now. Yeah. But it's a weird group, so there's there's a lot to kind of unpack. Because today we are talking about sloths. Sloths. <laughs> you have to say it like a sloth. <laughs> sloths. I'm doing as well as I can. <laughs> so that will ha. be our focus of today's episode. Ha. And... To top it off, it is actually a guest-requested episode. Yes, it is. Yeah. This subject was requested by Ian through Gmail. Yes, thank you, Ian. Yes, definitely. Because I've always had a soft spot for sloths. And we will be talking about sloths in general, but definitely focusing a lot on our fossil species, as this is a paleontology podcast. Yes. Actually, funnily enough, this also partially meets the requirements of another request that we got. Mm -hmm. from Shaley, who asked us to do an episode on weird South American mammals. Yes. So this is not that episode quite, but (laughs) this is like a piece of that episode. Yeah, we we will do (laughs) your requested episode, Shaley, via (laughs) mini-episodes. We'll do (laughs) each animal one at a time. By 2019, (laughs) your episode will be completed. (laughs) You will just splice (laughs) it together. (laughs) Before we get started today... Absolutely. We should also mention that we have, in between this episode and the last, a new patron mein Gott. on the Patreon, one Justin Smith. Thank you Ooh. for joining us. Absolutely. Welcome to the family. Welcome to the family. And actually, I believe that he is subscribed at the family level Hey, on our Patreon levels, because that's when you get a shout out on the podcast. So yeah. yes, welcome to the family. Welcome to the family. And later on, maybe welcome to the order and so on. So <laughs> <laughs> the order in the class and welcome to the common descent kingdom. <laughs> the other thing that we should point out, as we mentioned a bit last episode at the beginning, this is December. It is the end of the year. So as we are looking forward into 2018, we want to know from any of our listeners who want to tell us, what do you like about the podcast? What do you want to see? What do you want to see us do the same or different as we move into the new year? We are thinking about ways to to progress and Mm -hmm. to change if we want to as we move forward. So you let us know what you think. Yes, please do. Like We we say, say all the time to contact us and talk with us and let us know what you're thinking but we really do mean it we every time we get a message from one of you guys the listeners it's the highlight of that day it's always exciting when we get a cool comment or especially a question yes. and so please and we'd love to hear your advice slash suggestions slash encouragements on things to do more of and new things to do most certainly but before We can hear any of that before we can talk about sloths, and before anything else, we must talk about the news. The news. So, news number one for today is a new paper published in Science by Xiaolin Wang et al. about pterosaur eggs. Yes. Let's talk about those two words being together in a sentence. Yes. Pterosaurs, of course, are the flying reptiles from the Mesozoic era, famous... Mm -hmm. Pteranodon and Dimorphodon and so on. T 
pterosaur eggs are almost unheard of in the fossil record. Yeah. The first pterosaur eggs were discovered in 2004. Before <laughs> that, we weren't even sure that they laid eggs. Because <laughs> we didn't have any in the fossil record. And even still, there's less than a dozen, fewer than a dozen, pterosaur eggs that are known well-preserved from the fossil record. Mm -hmm. This study describes a fossil site that has more than 200 pterosaur eggs. Wow. Jesus. 200. Oh, my goodness. So this is a fossil site in Xinjiang, which is in the northwest of China, discovered about a decade ago. And when it was first discovered, it was interesting to begin with because there are over 40 pterosaur individuals preserved here. Wow. This is about a 100 million year old site. So we're looking at the late Cretaceous. The pterosaurs here were a new species called Hemipterus, which are, you know, wingspan, we're looking at up to about 10 foot wingspan, a little mm -hmm. over three meters at, at most. But the new study looks at the eggs. And to give you a sense of how many eggs there are, according to the new study, there is one patch of sandstone that they measured as part of this deposit mm -hmm. that is only about three square meters. All right. Not quite 10 square feet. And within that chunk, there were 215 eggs. Wow. On the surface. Wow. Just visible? Visible <laughs> on the surface. <laughs> not counting underneath. Wow. Even more exciting, they CT scanned a bunch of these eggs and found 16 of them with remnants of embryos inside. That's fantastic. This is super exciting for a couple of reasons. One, finding lots of adult pterosaurs and juvenile pterosaurs and eggs in the same site suggests that this was a communal nesting ground. Mm -hmm. So if you think of birds today like albatrosses that lay their nests on the ground and they all gather in these big Yeah, those big gatherings. Yeah. Communities. Gaggles. This was mm -hmm. gaggles of, of pterosaurs. <laughs> But the embryos also pointed at some aspects of pterosaur life history. Mm -hmm. What they found was that the embryos that appear to be close to hatching, and it's hard to know, but based on what they could see, the well-developed embryos had well-developed leg bones, All right. but poorly developed wing structures. The musculature and the attachment for the wings around the chest and the arms were not finished yet. So even though they were about to hatch, they did not have strong wing muscles yet. Yes, which leads the authors to think that when they hatched, they were probably, you know, hopping around, mm -hmm. but not flying yet. Very interesting. Which also suggests that they were probably taken care of by their parents. Yeah. So this one handful of discoveries here, this one site suggests communal nesting, possibly parental care, and mm -hmm. maybe a little bit about what pterosaurs were like, at least this species, when they first hatched. Yeah, very cool. Yes. That's fascinating. It's Anytime you find a really cool site like this is, is you know, a, a big new chapter in a book, but this is truly, you know, as you've said before, never had a find of this magnitude with pterosaurs. Absolutely. And so this is this is a lot. You know, who knows what more will be learned as they continue to look at it. That's very exciting. Yeah, to just to think about the kind of stuff we've been able to learn from dinosaur eggs mm -hmm. in the past. Yeah. To think that we could do those sorts of studies on pterosaur eggs about incubation period Absolutely. and how they develop. That's just... Like, anything that is an interesting question about dinosaurs is a doubly interesting question about pterosaurs just because they're so poorly understood mm -hmm. and they're not nearly as well represented yeah. in the fossil record. Exactly. And that's it's neat because these sort of discoveries have a um, domino falling action effect of the thing we learn here can lead to a new discovery which you know it just each one can lead to a new if we realize they have parental care then now we can look at some other aspect of pterosaurs yeah with that point of view 
and it can reshape that, which might reach and it's a really cool uh, outreaching when you have something this big that changes up the game. Definitely exciting things to come. So my first news article is not about a flying animal, but it's definitely about a weird one uh, that shares some seem, seemingly shares some features with modern day birds, which is not too unexpected because it's a dinosaur. Boy, is it a weird one. Yes. <laughs> so, so this study is in Nature, and it's by Andrea Cow and et al. Fairly recently described is, and many of you may have seen pictures of it because they've got a really great artist rendition of this dinosaur. There, it is a dinosaur that was from Mongolia. Interesting background, though, because it was smuggled out to Japan, then to Britain, mm -hmm. then to France, where it was brought up, bought up by a private collector who recognized it as weird and brought it to a paleontologist and eventually made sure it got back to its home. Very nice. Yeah, it was really so. It's got a really cool story. So that was in 2015 that it finally made it to the eyes of a paleontologist, uh, Pascal Gobfreut. Mm -hmm. And initially, upon looking at it, quoted from the researchers, they were pretty sure it might be a fake because of how <laughs> odd this animal is. Yeah. This dinosaur has, looking at a long, skinny, at as they describe, swan-like neck. Mm hmm. A very narrow mouth and a uh, uh, muzzle mm -hmm. so very thin and pointed it's got long back legs with sickled claws you yeah, know velociraptor style exactly uh so this is a theropod it's got a long tail but not a strong tail it's not good for counterbalance interesting so it ap appears to stand more upright kind of like a puffin if you you know like yeah, yeah. It, it's holding itself almost over its legs and it's got these shortened forearms with flat bones, very reminiscent of swimming birds today, like puffins and penguins, in their shape. So it's like if you took a Velociraptor-style dinosaur and tried to make it swan-like. Yes, because it's still got grasping hands but it's also got flattened bones and it's still got these long legs but then it doesn't seem to be very well adapted for running so it seems to be Ooh. one of one of the first you know good good examples of a semi-aquatic swimming and running dinosaur like walking and able to swim at the same time dinosaur fascinating swan raptor swan raptor and so this dinosaur is hulshka raptor Esquie, and those names are actually pertinent because they're in honor of uh, two different people. Uh, yeah. The Hulshka is named after a Polish paleontologist who's discovered like some odd a dozen Mongolian dinosaurs, and I think more than f has more than four species named after her. Cool. So she's getting honored in this one, and the species name is in honor of Francois Esquie, who is the French collector. Who first brought the fossil to paleontologist? Oh, yeah, very nice. I was very, I, I, I really appreciated that because, you know, we already had a news article about fossils getting smuggled and the dangers yep. therein. The fact that it not only made it home but it was brought forward by a person who bought it is really cool. yeah, that's awesome. This dinosaur is dated to the late Cretaceous, 75, 71 million years old. And they did some interesting studies on it because, like I said, initially, they truly believed it was a fake, uh, what they call a chimera. Yeah, when where you have multiple mm -hmm. fossils stuck together. this And that's pretty common. Absolutely. A thing you have to look out for, mostly when they're collected by, you know, a farmer or, a, yeah. or someone who wants to sell the fossil. If I'm a low-income person and I know I can sell a fossil, but I know it looks cooler to have teeth and claws on it. Mm-hmm then I'm going to find as many as I can and glue the cool pieces together. Yeah, even if you're a high-income person. Mm -hmm. The way they decided to check for that was by 3D scanning it, a synchrotron radiation scanning, which sounds like something out of a sci-fi movie. Sure does. But it is a high-intensity scanner that let them look the rock through and see mm -hmm. that it is one solid piece, and that the yeah. parts of the fossil hidden within the rock are matching to the ones exposed on the outside. So it's yeah. not it's been modified on the surface. 
And that not only gave them a view of the body, but gave them the conclusion that it is legitimate. Very cool. Yeah, and part of the reason this is so significant uh, is we talk about lots of weird dinosaurs all the time, but there are a couple of types of lifestyles that we don't tend to see in dinosaurs, and mm -hmm. it's odd in their absence, and one of them is aquatic. This is yeah. one of, like, before Spinosaurus got reshaped mm -hmm. into its uh, a potential new body form, there were no real aquatic dinosaurs. There were dinosaurs that seemed to have fish-eating tendencies, but they were more like a stork that were going into the water and catching a fish and then walking away. Yeah, out, there are definitely aquatic birds, and there yes. were aquatic birds in the Cretaceous. Yes. But as far as non-avian dinosaurs mm -hmm. go, the only aquatic ten, uh, tendency, the only aquatic adaptations we've ever seen in a non-avian dinosaur are the dense bones of Spinosaurus. Yes. That's that this was an animal that was possibly spending more time in the water. Mm -hmm. But to find a dinosaur that has possible swimming adaptations mm -hmm. in addition to fish catching face yeah. and maybe even reducing its running capability yeah. to make way for swimming adaptations is insane. It's very cool. They, they uh, hypothesize that since it did still have very prominent legs, even though it wasn't as great at running that it may have been in a environment where it was it was between wet and dry a flood plain or something like that yeah, where, yeah. uh now they they do you know the fish eating ability is definitely there with uh, a toothy mouth the front teeth are much more numerous than most dinosaurs mhm mm but they definitely wanted to preface that they can't yet say that they use the arms like the flippers of a penguin or anything yet right. until they can look at the shoulder girl and see how that's set up. But yeah. there's definitely parallels there, so it's something to look into. Very cool. It makes sense. It absolutely right? it, does. It's always been weird that we didn't have semi-aquatic non-bird yeah. dinosaurs. Absolutely. It's, it's you know, every other group has done it. You know, there's semi-aquatic members of just about every reptile group of mammals, insects, so it was weird that dinosaurs were keeping their toes yeah. dry. Very interesting. I will be super interested to see what more comes out of this discovery. Absolutely. News number three. So, hey, remember last episode where I cheated? I'm cheating again. A lot, you dirty, rotten cheater. I cheat all the time. This news isn't even a new research article. <laughs> this is law and politics and just a really fascinating development that is happening Right. This is some of the biggest news in paleontology right now, actually. It, it, it is. It's, it's significant. In episode 17, we talked about the Society of Vertebrate Paleontology. Mm -hmm. This is an organization that supports the work of paleontologists around the world, publishes a journal, hosts the meeting, does all sorts of programs to benefit paleontological research and mm -hmm. education. Well, the Society of Vertebrate Paleontology is suing the president. Yeah, a little bit. Not not just any president, the president of the United States. <laughs> not the not the president of the automotive club. <laughs> <laughs> no no no, this is the president. <laughs> Here's the situation. Very recently, United States President Donald Trump signed a presidential proclamation to shrink two national monuments in the state of Utah because these monuments are major sources of paleontological information as well as Native American cultural information and other environmental resources. Mm -hmm. And because there are legal arguments that the president does not have the authority to do this change, several organizations, including the Society of Vertebrate Paleontology, are planning to take this issue to court mm -hmm. against the presidential administration to stop this shrinking of these monuments. Yeah. Here's some of the background about these monuments. These are Bears Ears National Monument and Grand Staircase Escalante Monument, both in Utah. Originally, they were established by former presidents Clinton and Obama for purposes, as with most national monuments, to preserve culture, history, natural resources. Yeah. Because, again, Native American sites, all sorts, these are, you know natural ecosystems with lots going for them in terms of things we want to protect. 
being monuments, having that status, offers them special protections, offers high priority to certain endeavors like mm -hmm. research, and prevents activities that could be da dangerous or damaging, like mining and drilling and fracking and things like that. Yes. The new presidential proclamation shrinks Grand Staircase Escalante by about half of its size and shrinks Bears Ears by more than 80%. Whew. So people who are fans of these monuments are unhappy. Specifically for paleontology, the reason that, paleontolo that this has gotten the attention of paleontologists is because there are literally hundreds of individual fossil sites in the areas... Mm -hmm who are having their protection removed. And these hundreds of fossil sites include some of the only sites in the world that give us insight into the end Permian mass extinction, mm -hmm. the Triassic period and the early evolution of the dinosaurs, fossil sites that are important in the early evolution of mammals, mm -hmm. fossil sites that show us what was happening in the world leading up to the end Cretaceous mass extinction that took out the non-avian dinosaurs, there's plenty of Ice Age fossil sites there, and a lot of these sites and the fossils in them are unique. Yeah. There are several new dinosaur species, for example, that have been discovered in these monuments over the last decade or so. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there are many, many, many paleontologists today actively working on research in this area. Yeah. So removing the status of of the monument protection from these areas is going to, people are concerned, not only, you know, open them up to activities that could damage these important sites, but it's going to mean that paleontological research is no longer high priority, which means it's very likely that research projects will either be, could stop or not mm -hmm. get off the ground. There is less protection outside of monuments to protect against illegal activities like fossil theft. Yes. Monuments that have designated resources also allocate designated funding. So there are lots of paleontologists that have very secure sources of funding to do this research mm -hmm. that won't have that anymore. There won't necessarily be the opportunity for researchers to go back and you know, excavate more or double check on previous mm -hmm. activity and previous research that's been done there. So this this will be a major issue for active research, and it it could potentially cut off or even destroy a lot of really very, very significant fossil sites yeah. like nowhere else in the world. The legal arguments here, which we won't get too much into because that's not what we're about, Basically, President Trump says that the creation of the monuments was outside the authority of the presidents that did it in the first place, and that what this does is it locks up lots of land under too strict government control, mm -hmm. whereas the legal support that SVP and the other organizations, their SVP, several Native American tribes, some environmentalist organizations, at least one outdoor company, mm -hmm. are all sort of joining together in this effort to sue over this. And their argument legally is that the president does not have the authority to sh shrink the monuments and that they need congressional approval to do it. Mm -hmm. And they're concerned that this could set a precedent that means that any president can just start shrinking monuments on a whim, mm -hmm. which is not a great thing for people who want to work or preserve monuments. Absolutely. This is a topic worthy of much more focus and discussion than a five-minute <laughs> overview on the news here. <laughs> so we will put, as always, we'll put, we'll, we'll probably put a couple of links to this one in the blog post so that you can check it out because this is big deal and there's a lot of folks riled up about this. Well, it, it, it's very recent. You know, it's, you know, typically when we, New news, it's something that came out and like, all right, dinosaurs discovered, it's been described, here's the paper. This is right. happening, like developments are still happening right now while we're recording this. <laughs> so, yeah, no, absolutely. <laughs> this is a living news source. <laughs> yeah, I think this was announced on the 4th, mm -hmm. I think is when is when he signed the, the papers for it. Yeah, it's it's interesting. 
interestingly enough, this is not the first time SVP has gotten legal. Yeah. Uh, it's not common because that's not their main thing. But when it comes to protecting paleontological mm -hmm. resources, efforts through SVP were actually important in establishing a current bit of legislation, the Paleontological Resources Preservation Act, oh, which wow, was yeah. established in 2009. So there's precedent for, mm -hmm. for the Society of Vertebrate Paleontology and other scientific organizations to step up in a legal sense, in a political sense, in protection, in defense of scientific resources. Yeah, it's, it's always weird because you typically think about a lot of things as being compartmentalized from each other. You know, science mm -hmm. is in the science category, government and law is in you know, their legal yeah. category and blah, blah, blah. But, you know, more often than you think, a lot of times they do overlap, you know, especially, you know, with when we were talking about the, um, you know, once again, back to smuggling fossils, yep. a big part of that, especially in developing countries or countries where the practice of paleontology is younger, mm -hmm. you know, is getting laws in place that are going to back up you trying, to, you know, it's great if you're trying to hunt down lost fossils, but if none of the laws are saying that you're correct to do so, then it doesn't matter when you find them. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, there's a, there's a, a lot more overlap than you'd expect between yeah. paleontology and politics. But that is where my knowledge on it ends. So <laughs> <laughs> yes, we will be keeping up with this. That's where, yeah, that's the end of the story as it continues yep. to develop. Yep. So we'll see where that goes. So the next uh, new source is not nearly as, you know, ground shaking, <laughs> but I still encourage you to listen up because it's all about inner ears. Ha <laughs> ha. Oh, oh, I oh. see. You oh. did a thing. Oh, I did it. Levity. <laughs> Levity. That's how we oh. segue away from the destruction of natural paleontological <laughs> resources. Yeah, I, I hear humor is how to get the kids to listen. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so <laughs> this next article, this is actually probably one of my favorite news articles I've done in a while because it's, it's really interesting to me. This is about the inner ear of sauropterygians, which... What? For anyone who that word is new, this is the group that contains plesiosaurs and mm -hmm. pliosaurs, you know, the the ever so famous from our childhood memes, Leoplorodon. And yes. So <laughs> These were the swimming reptiles in the Mesozoic yep. with big flipper arms and plesiosaurs had long necks. Yeah. Pliosaurs Absolutely. were scrunchy. scrunchy they had neck. short necks, big long heads. Yes. Very diverse group. It it also included coastal uh, specimens that were more that were limbed. They didn't have flippers. They were, you know, mm -hmm. had limbs and were living on the shoreline or in and out of the water. Even if they were mostly aquatic, they still had four limbs that right, could walk. Right. In this one, the researchers, and this is in Current Biology, and it's. Uh, James Neenan et al. And they looked at the inner ear. Now, the inner ear is the series of looping tubes that you always saw pictures of back in, you know, your your bio, your intro science classes that mm -hmm. give us equilibrium. It's what gives us balance. It what lets us know when we're upside down and when we're moving yeah. and when we're not moving. The fluid in the tubes moves and the little hairs tell us which way it's moving. They're why you get dizzy and all that good stuff. Different animals have different inner ears depending on the jobs they're needing to do. You know, flying yeah. animals versus terrestrial land animals versus aquatic animals versus climbing animals need to be able to adjust to different forces and movements. Mm -hmm. You know, if I'm on land, I'm not likely to do a barrel roll at high speeds anytime. Yes. Because I can't fly or swim. Mm-hmm. You know, so on and so forth. If I'm swinging through the branches, I may need to be able to adjust a different motion. And you can look, you can learn a lot about an animal's lifestyle by comparing the inner ears. You know, inner, animals with similar lifestyles tend to have similar shapes to that inner ear structure. Mm -hmm. So they looked at sauropterygians' inner ears, and they found some really cool parallels. Some, you know, make sense right on the surface. Some are super weird. So looking at the Two, you know, first two groups being the, as they compare it, turtle-like sauropterygians, the four flippered, you know, underwater flyers, quote unquote, mm -hmm. the ones that are gliding through the water and 
truly fully aquatic. They compare them to sea turtles. Right. When looking at the, comp they compared them to a, a large variety of animals, but they found the closest comparison in them and sea turtles in the shape of their inner ear. And when they looked at the coastal sauropterygians I mentioned, they found the closest line with them with crocodilians. Interesting. So they developed similar inner ear structures. Yes to sea turtles and crocs, which seems to make sense given the similar Absolutely. lifestyles. Absolutely. And then to, to emphasize, even though these animals that we've all mentioned all fall within reptiles, they are not closely related. No. The Sauropterygians are an, instinct, an extinct group. They don't have any modern descendants. This is made more significant when the next comparison is brought up, and it's between the pliosaur, or the pliosauromorphs, which are four-flippered, Mm -hmm. ranged in size, but some of them got huge. You know, yeah. the chronosaurs and the leopleurodon were massive, short-necked, big-headed, large-jawed yeah. predators. Their inner ears were most similar to whales. That's really interesting, because as you were describing them, yep. short-necked, large-headed, yep. yeah, no, that's a very similar body shape. And that's, that's one of the reasons, because whales today have very small inner ears compared to their body size and it's par they think it's partially because of that short neck whales aren't doing crazy fast paced backflips and everything they're moving in a much different way and their head isn't moving really yeah. separately from the body you know it's moving as a line and the pliosaurs have a very similar body design and have very similar inner ears for th the conclusion is similar reasons that's really cool. Inner That's ear awesome. studies show up a lot in paleontology. Mm -hmm. the, the the first famous discovery of a, quote, walking whale, right? The, the yes, land-dwelling yes. ancestors of whales were identified based on the inner ear, right. being similar yep. to modern-day cetaceans. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you were talking about inner ear structure varying based on lifestyle, Way back in episode three, when we talked about snakes yes. and trying to figure out the habitats of early snakes, one of the ways that researchers do that is by looking at the ear. Yeah. Aquatic, terrestrial, subterranean, mm -hmm. you can potentially read those in the inner ear structure. You get convergent evolution. If you're doing a similar job, you're going to have to come to similar uh, solutions to the same problems. See, I read this quick the first time I read it, and it was it said, oh, you know, similar inner ear structures to whales and sea turtles and crocs. And I thought, that's cool, convergent evolution. Mm -hmm. But the fact that the turtle-like body shapes yep. had turtle-like inner ears and the whale-like body shapes had whale-like inner ears, that's some intense convergence. I love it. It's so cool. <laughs> it's really, they Very have really fascinating. great images. You know, follow the link when we put it up on the blog post, but they have really great images showing 3D scans of the different inner ears. And you can see, you can start to follow the pattern. It's really fun. Awesome. Yes. And with that final and riveting news source, we conclude the news section and move on to the main event. And now the main event. So our main subject today is sloths. With a, Sloth. a focus on the fossil, but I want to give an intro because... For any of you who may be unfamiliar with these animals, and I doubt that's anyone because they've made kind of a big <laughs> deal on the internet. <laughs> They're like second to cats and dogs. Yeah, and I, th I really think that's only Third due to the speed. If they yeah, just, it must be. Yeah, it's just, it's just due to the speed. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> if we put them on roller skates, they'd reach number one. Sloths are very unusual animals. And they're part of yes. a group of unusual animals in general, but they are particularly weird. Mm -hmm. And we're going to go over it. But first, to learn a little bit about their their family tree. Mm -hmm. Sloths are part of a group called Xenarthrans. Yeah, Xenarthrans have a bit of this reputation mm -hmm. among people who study mammals or, or anything, really. They're just so weird. They're like the weird cousin that, that like... You only see it, the family gatherings, and just, you never click. They're just odd yeah. compared to the rest of Mammalia. Mm -hmm. Xenarthrans, uh, classically a South American group. That's where you find most of them, though we do have quite a few who are here in North America. Mm -hmm. 
they are a group that includes armadillos, anteaters, and sloths. Yeah. Now, they have had a weird um, history in what animals were included in it, because they used to be grouped in something called, a uh, clade called edentata, that was the no teeth, mm-hmm. that included penguins and uh, uh, aardvarks. Yeah. Since then, penguins and aardvarks have been separated into their own orders, and these enarthrins are now separate with Old World, New World. And they have some unique features. Uh, the name Xenarthra means extra or, or strange joints because their backbones have these extra like prongs that come off of each vertebrae for yeah. extra articulation. And on armadillos, this makes sense because those actually meet up with the outer armor like supports okay. and whatnot. I mean, yeah. like you can see how it meets up, but all of them have it. <laughs> <laughs> They also all share the weird trait of having large claws. Interesting. Like, that's, that's, anteaters all have those large claws for breaking it open. Armadillos have, even if they're yeah. not diggers, you know, there's, arm, you know, armadillos who are not burrowers, but they still have prominent claws. And the sloths all have yeah. large claws. The group has lots of variety within it. It's broken into two orders, the, the cingulata, which includes armadillos, the dazipotidae. And that also includes their fossil relatives, which we'll talk about in just a moment, the glyptodons, which mm-hmm. are very cool. Then the pilosa, which are the, has the two suborders for anteaters and sloths. Anteaters are the vermilunga. Yeah. And the sloths are the uh, foldivora. Foldivora. And Leaf eating. Yeah. Yeah. Which is <laughs> definitely true for the modern ones, and we'll get into thoughts on all the fossil ones. Because they got some cool stuff. Now, these groups, as I said, mostly South American. Mm-hmm. And, as you know, for, for the most part, what we can see, originally South American. And they show up, the first primitive ar- armadillo shows up 60 million years ago. Yeah. And so, you know, recent, after the dinosaurs passed away in the late Paleocene. And we'll get into this in more detail, but then they spread out from there and diversify. And... You can just see as time goes on, they start getting more and more of the weird forms. And part of the reason that some scientists think that they were able to diversify the way they did is because they're already very unique niche animals. They're Mm -hmm. filling really unique roles. Yeah. And and we should point out that much of this evolution was happening in South America. Yes. Absolutely. around the time that the Cretaceous was ending, South America was finishing splitting off from everyone else in the world. Mm -hmm. So South America spent most of the Cenozoic isolated, the same way Australia is. Absolutely. That's what I was about to compare it to. Yeah. And the same way that Australia is dominated by marsupials, because it hasn't had these connections Mm -hmm. to other continents, South America evolved weird mammals, right? When we say weird, of course, we mean unusual. Yeah. And they're unusual because the rest of the world, right, North America, Africa, Europe, Asia, were connected, so the animals that evolved in those areas were spreading out and diversifying, whereas xenarthrins and their and other South American mammals mm-hmm. hanging out by themselves in South America were weird. Just getting weirder and weirder. They were only hanging out with themselves. Yeah, just... Palinar, yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> it's a so weird Xenarthran it's... incestual continent. <laughs> yeah, the uh, what's the term nowadays? The echo chamber. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> and it's really interesting that you mentioned that they had the big claws and the specialized yeah. vertebrae throughout the group because it really makes you wonder how they started. Yes, and they also have a, a fused pelvis. Their their ischium yeah. is fused to the sacrum, the backbone, and that's. Once again, unusual among mammals. Like It really gives off the impression, and I don't know much about the details of early, early Xenarthrin yeah, yeah, evolution, yeah. but it, it's reminiscent of what's called the founder effect, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. where you have certain traits are, are present in the original population, and then they stick around as that group diversifies. It sounds like Xenarthrin started off as weird animals in South America, yeah, and then because it was isolated, they just kept giving rise to weird yep. descendants. Absolutely, uh, and they're still weird today. Yeah. Now, before I get into sloths, I want to talk 
which is a little bit about one of the extinct groups. There's there's plenty of extincts in Northerns that you can go through, but uh, probably one of the ones that is most famous second to the fossil sloths is the Glyptodons. Yes, the big Volkswagen Beetle oh, man. armor dudes. So these these are cousins of the armadillos. They're in the Singulata order, mm-hmm. but huge. Um, both armadillos and glyptons have osteoderms, which, as we've mentioned before, are bony elements in or on the skin. Yes. And armadillos are different in the fact that theirs is flexible. You know, mm-hmm. nowadays, if you ever get to hold an armadillo, it's it's like a sectioned layer that is tough, but it actually can bend and it can flex. Yeah, yeah. So the animal can move within it and they can flatten themselves out and everything. Glyptodons, it was fused in this big shell and yes. it's like a dome. The The Volkswagen Beetle is a great <laughs> comparison because it, it's this huge dome. Some of them were 10 feet long yep. <laughs> and about five feet tall <laughs> with the dome. I mean, this is huge. And then they would have these armored tails. Some of them actually had spiked clubs at the end. Yeah, they were the mammalian ankylosaurs. They really were, and they were uh, they were crazy. And they, as we'll get into, we'll get into the distribution of the xenarthrins. You know, it'll be mentioned here and there, but we'll get into it in detail at the end. Uh, but lots of these animals you'll hear about because they did make it to North America. So mm-hmm. even though they started South American, we eventually got them up here in the continent that two of us are in. And yes, <laughs> they you know, even continue to diversify from there. So they were equally successful in many ways. Yeah. Speaking of weird things about Xenarthrans, that Mm -hmm. they are, as far as I'm aware, the only mammal group. Yeah. If they're not the only ones, they're the only ones that did it in a big way (laughs) to have osteoderms, Mm -hmm. bony armor that grows in the skin. You know, crocs have it, turtles have it. Uh, Mm -hmm. You see it in lizards, and you see it in dinosaurs, and you see it in frogs. Yeah. But it is not common in mammals except for xenarthrans. And it's, it's, and it, and they didn't just like dabble with it. They went full out. Yeah. Completely (laughs) armored. Even some sloths. More on that in a bit. Yes. So on to sloths, but we're going to start with the ones that we know and many of you love is the modern sloths. I want to give a little bit, you know, work backwards a little bit so that we can get to know what our sloths are like today because there's a lot of similarities. Yeah. A lot more than you expect considering how different they are, but there are. And if anybody out there is friends with Kristen Bell, (laughs) tell her to listen to this episode. Yes, yes. (laughs) It's all about sloths. I have a friend at the aquarium that I was was requested to send the link to after this (laughs) (laughs) because she's a big fan of sloths. Excellent. Uh, (laughs) <laughs> we'll definitely in the blog post we'll end it with like a adorable sloth video. <laughs> I had I remember there was a video of a sloth nursery. Yes. That I came yes. across at one point and it was like little sloths like crawling around mm-hmm. and reaching out for food and being all adorable and I found that if you mute the video and put on the Halloween yep. theme in the background it completely changes the tone. <laughs> <laughs> They're one soundtrack away from being horror monsters. Yes. <laughs> oh, no, it was fantastic. <laughs> so, these terrifying creatures. Yes. Modern sloths <laughs> are these classified into... horrifying sloths. These horrifying sloths are classified into two families, which in total include six species. Yes, not very many sloths today. Not a lot, and it's just two varieties, the two-toed and the three-toed are the two fl- families. Mm-hmm. And there's only two species of the two-toed, convenient. Yep. And there's four species of the three-toed. Less convenient. Yeah, it's it's one too many, but... We're working all... on it. Yeah. That's dark We're, humor. <laughs> give it, I was going to say, give us some time. <laughs> <laughs> With apologies to all the sloth Keep fans out there. buying that palm oil and... Uh, <laughs> uh. The, they're all South American, all forest-dwelling... And there is some variety among them, like there's a pygmy sloth, and they vary in size, and there's some mm-hmm. differences there, but they share a lot of features. The we'll start with the two-toed. These are interesting because they're in the they're in the family Megalonychidae, and their genus is Coleopus. Mm-hmm. So one of the first unique things, and we'll get into this more detail, but the two-toeds are the only modern sloth that shares their family with some of the big famous ground sloths. Yeah. 
And so that will be our next subject is those big guys. But these are slightly larger than their three-toed cousins. Mm -hmm. As their name suggests, they only have two claws on the front. Uh, both groups have three claws on the back, but literally just two fingers. <laughs> yeah, funnily enough, both two-toed and three-toed sloths have three toes. Yes. It's the number of fingers that's different. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so these are the two-fingered slots. <laughs> <laughs> Names. What? The other weird thing, when it comes to numbers of things they have, mm -hmm. is neck bones. Yes. And this is super bizarre, because not only is the two-toed weird, the three-toed is also weird, and in a different direction. So cerc cervical vertebrae are our neck bones, and almost all mammals except for the sloths and the manatee, mm -hmm. have seven neck vertebrae. Yep. Giraffes, people, whales, seven neck vertebrae. Across the board, two-toed has six. And evidently, there's been ones that have five. So cool. they have fewer. The three-toed has nine. <laughs> <laughs> it's like Xenorthrans had a meeting. Yes. It's like they got together... And they're like, all right, now that South America is split off from the rest of the world, we're going to do things different around here. Yep. What are they doing no. out there? Seven neck vertebrae? Forget that. <laughs> Nine neck vertebrae. No, six. Well, you, you <laughs> six over there. Yes. We'll, we'll, we'll see which one works and we'll reconvene. But take, get rid of one of your fingers. Yes. <laughs> if you're going to go down with that, you have to, you have to reduce, we will add. It's... And the, the reason for the nine neck verts and the three-toed is that it allows them to rotate their head 270 degrees. <laughs> like an owl. So they can, yeah, exactly. So they can hang there and just completely scan everywhere weird. and look around. So Such it's weird animals. <laughs> very bizarre. They also have very distinct diets from each other. The, you know, they're both very similar and very slow metabolisms. You know, they, they, it takes them week to weeks to digest stuff. Yeah. You know, they're very similar in that way, and they have a very long gut for that slow digestion, but the two-toed is much more varied. They eat insects, lots of leaves. Carrion is evidently on their list. Mm -hmm. Fruit, insects. They've even been known to catch, you know, small lizards if they get the chance. Cool. So, I mean, they're, they're eating kind of whatever they can find up in the trees, while the... Three-toed is just leaf eater. Interesting. And they have a very you know, specialized gut for that, and they come down once a week to defecate and urinate and mm -hmm. go back up. And they even use the same spot a lot of the time, which is yeah weird. That's just interesting. And another weird difference between them is the three-toed has tails and the two-toed does not. Weird. <laughs> yeah, it's just... These are these weird are really stuff. Cool <laughs> they're just they're so neat and bizarre. They're cool to learn about. As a group, they have weirdness that they both share. Once again, very slow metabolism, so much to the point to where they're not fully, you know, endothermic or warm blooded, as you often hear. But yeah, they're heterothermic, which means that they kind of switch between, or they are on the barrier between homeothermic, where you. Can Maintain your body temperature in a, a new term I learned, poikilothermic, where you your body temperature is subject to vast change. Yeah. The reason that term is separate from your typical ectothermic or cold-blooded is that you can have ectothermic animals that maintain a constant body temperature either by being in a yeah. very steady environment or like, you know, great whites maintain it through muscle movement. Yeah. But if they stop swimming, they would cool, cool down, you know, so... This is one of the animal that does regularly vastly change. Yeah, so it's a, it's still an endotherm. Yeah. It's still producing its own heat because mm -hmm. it's a mammal, but that body temperature Can fluctuates way more than your standard, quote, warm-blooded animal. And so it can still enter things like torpor, where it can go into a suspended animation like reptiles do when they get too cold. Neat. And so it's, it's super weird. Some of them have been known to take a month to digest their food. Mm-hmm. It's very, as the name suggests, very slow in every aspect. Not only in their movements, but in their digestion. Yeah. <laughs> their fur grows backwards, where it's not as in it, like, grows outside in, but it grows <laughs> toward the back. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> and so like if you see the videos where they're taking care of a sloth they always look like they have a little mohawk because their fur grows the way they hang so it's growing toward the ground while they're upside down cool. and so that the water runs off them the right way they get algae in their fur and moths mm-hmm. that they're like a moving little caravan for the moths that breed in their fur they're yeah. quite good swimmers yeah most mammals you are. wouldn't expect them to be being so slow and uh, laborious in their movements but they are very good swimmers because their forests get flooded yeah and so they they navigate the trees during that time just slowly doing the doggy paddle they have weird teeth yeah open rooted teeth so they continually grow as they grind their food down but to give you a little bit on teeth anatomy your tooth has m- different materials inside of it the cores of most mammal teeth is made out of dentine mm-hmm. which is you know have varying hardnesses and can be you know made in different ways but it's what the most of your tooth is made out of and then on our teeth and many other mammals you have a coating of enamel yeah which think of it like protective gloss on a pot piece of pottery or you know, yeah, you know yeah. tiling extremely hard brittle that's why you can crack your teeth the dentine and enamel are brittle but they are the hardest part of a mammal body they're very tough yeah and cementum is the material that attaches a lot of these different materials and it it can be reorganized in all sorts of different ways depending on which mammal you're looking at different layers of different dentines and differing amounts sloths just don't have enamel yep no enamel they have two different kinds of dentines that are in like a cylinder and so that while they chew the softer dentine wears away differently than the harder dentine on the outside of the tooth and it creates chewing surfaces very interesting and they just just if you ever get a chance to look it up but having gotten to see the skull you know in person Mm -hmm. they're just like little pegs they come out and then they have kind of like a little wavy top but there's nothing like complicated they're just little pegs that come out and they're flat on top and then as they chew they get wavy and bumpy to better grind the plants yeah they're very simple teeth which are also not what you see in most mammals no and it makes it very hard to compare them to other mammals because they're so different you know tooth morphology is yes. a big part in studying mammals this one does not help no nope. the other thing is they have no baby teeth which is weird interesting they only have yeah. one set yeah. Well, their teeth grow forever, don't they? Exactly. So they just have ever one set of teeth. ever-growing teeth. Yeah. Also very strange. Yeah. <laughs> very weird. their teeth weird. don't stop growing. They've also reduced down. They have no incisors. They don't have any, For we're pretty sure for the most part, true canines, but the mm-hmm. two-toed have caniform. They're sharp teeth. The upper ones may be actually canines, but the bottom ones probably aren't. That, that they're just... Cheek Sharp. teeth, right? Premolars yeah. that have taken on the shape of canines. And from what I've heard, I've never handled a sloth, but I've I've heard that they can give you quite a bite. Like two toed oh, sure. sloths are actually <laughs> kind of uh, uh, jerks. They'll happily bite you, and <laughs> it's not fun. <laughs> Take that, sloths. Yes, you jerks, you slowpokes. <laughs> ah, the weirdest thing about modern sloths, and this will transition us nicely into talking about their big fossil relatives is that the two modern groups the two and three toed do not seem to be closely related yeah they as far as research tells us now their last common ancestor split 40 million years ago yeah and that's that's we've talked about this a few times in other episodes mm-hmm. that you get situations like that when you have remnants of very diverse mm-hmm. and ancient groups yes so these are two different branches of the sloth family tree that evolved similar lifestyles absolutely and happened to have survived when the rest of their family tree did not and if if all of that evidence we have for their history is true that goes to show that their lifestyle today is a very extreme case of convergent evolution Yes. These are extremely similar animals with some weird differences. You know, now things like the neck vertebrae, even though they're weird, it makes sense that there's differences because they're not closely related. But if you just showed 
to a three toad and two sloth to the general public, they look extremely similar. People have trouble with alligators and crocodiles who are yeah. closely related. These are not closely related and are almost identical at a glance. Yeah, that's a, a really interesting It's weird. Case. It's also interesting because there's no evidence for suspensory, a.k.a. climbing upside down, locomotion in the fossil record of sloths. Yes. There are some we see that we think might climb, and we'll talk about those as we yeah. get to them, but we don't see any that show the body plan of these two. So not only is it convergent evolution, evidently they came to something that's not wasn't common <laughs> in their group. Yeah. On the, it's really weird. <laughs> it's also worth considering, I think, that arboreal, right, mm -hmm. tree dwelling animals are not nearly as common in the fossil Absolutely. record. Absolutely. And tr if they if you know if they were also tropical, mm -hmm. you know, forest Which dwellers, is not we good might for not for fossils either. Yep. So it might be that there were more and we just they're you know, some animals are not their lifestyle is very much a tough thing to fossilize. They're bad at being fossils. Yes. There, I did find one thesis that had looked at the developmental paths of different sloths and found that even though they're vastly different from a lot of other fossil sloths, mm -hmm. and even though they're not close, they were developing in a very similar way, so there seems to be an ancestral similarity to many of the traits they have. So maybe it's not so weird that they followed each other. Yeah, maybe they're just not very diverse to begin with. Yeah, that there is there's connections there. Uh, you know, I have I, you know I don't know how many other people feel that way, but there's there's definitely yeah, yeah. people are looking at this because it's weird, and it deserves to be looked into. Yes. Now, having mentioned their evolution and their their ancestors or their distant relatives, the biggest and most probably popular of all the fossil xenarthrins, even more so than the glyptodons many times, mm -hmm. are the ground sloths. Yeah, well, and this is an interesting note that I found myself slightly confused about mm -hmm. when I started researching sloths for this episode. Right, giant ground sloths are super famous. Yes. Right, the Ice Age, the giant ground sloths. Mm -hmm. But ground sloths refers... To yes. almost all fossil sloths, <laughs> yep. because they lived on the ground. <laughs> yep. Like because tree sloths, the six species that we have today, are the weird ones. Yep. So it's super bizarre that we refer to fossil sloths as ground sloths because they lived on the ground. It's yep. like if you referred to fish as swimming fish. <laughs> These right here are the fish that live in the water. Yep. It's, it's, They're all ground sloths. It really should be sloths and then the tree weirdos. But <laughs> the ground ones didn't make it till today. <laughs> yeah, and it's the same thing as non-avian dinosaurs. Yes, it's, I, I, that term always throws me. Because I'm like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, almost all of them were non-avian. Yes. We, we came up with that term because the only ones left are weird. Yep, because we named birds first. <laughs> Then we found fossils. <laughs> yes. So with the, like at some point it was very sensible for someone to go, wow, this is a giant ground dwelling version of a sloth. Yeah. How weird is that? Ground sloth. Well, and then it turns out and they're then all this ground one sloths. is also, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and that one over there. Where did your sloth live? On the ground. Huh. Quinky <laughs> dinks never. I, we should say they're mostly ground sloths. Yes. There's the tree sloths. And then there's that other weird group. And they used to be uh, grouped that way. They used to be grouped as the ground and the tree sloths. Yeah. And it wasn't until more analysis was done on their groupings that we found out that the tree sloths are, uh, the, are not really grouped together. The two toed yeah. are more closely related to many of the big famous ground sloths than the three toed are. Yeah, the two toed sloth family that they belong mm -hmm. to, the Megalonychidae, which is named after the giant ground sloth megalonyx. Yes. And so they have a very interesting dynamic with their family. They're also really diverse. Like, we get used to sloths being fairly similar today, and when I say ground sloth, probably the first picture that comes to the mind is most likely megalonyx. Yeah. Big, 
barrel chested four limbed kind of bear in shape but with these massive claws snub nosed yep. they can they have a vari- variety of head lengths but longish flat nosed mm-hmm. big shaggy animal that you've seen in a museum or it's the big thing that they release that takes 15 minutes to attack Hermes in the Futurama episode with the caveman. <laughs> it's the classic ground sloth, but they have yeah. a ton of variety. You have the giants, you had smaller ones. There are ones that have some very peculiar lifestyles. Yeah, and they go back a long time. Yes, they do. And they uh, ranged quite a bit. You know, they, they lived in a number of, vari- uh, number of environments from mainland to islands to coastal and Mm -hmm. eventually all the way up to the arctic circle around alaska yeah so they they were a big time group of animals that lasted right up until the the recent of earth's history i mean it's it was not long ago at all that they were still roaming around no we hunted them we hunted them so i mean they fed early humans and Probably scared off early humans. Oh, yeah. They were around very recently. Yeah. And they had some unique features. Let's talk about it. So many of their things they do share with modern sloths. They had the fused pelvis. Mm -hmm. They had the weird teeth. They had big claws. Much bigger and more robust for most of them. These things were truly massive. They also had digit reduction. There's a few that have five digits but many of them have reduced down their their um, number of digits to just all the way from you know just one to having only uh, to having four to having three some of them did it on the back feet as well interesting so like the modern sloths very much There's like the modern three sloths. toes and two or three fingers and even the one that had uh the ones that have five fingers had reduced the thumb to just being one you know, yeah, bone, one phalanx. So, once again, reducing digits, fused pelvis, much more robust. Their pelvises are like giant bowls. Yeah, sloth pelvises are super strange. It's very, They have a very weird skeleton because they're very open. Uh, most likely to hold big guts for digesting lots of plants because many yeah. of them seem to be herbivores just like the modern ones. They're like big barrels. They, yeah, and barrel-chested was one of the descriptions I found for yep. their rib cage, and that really, it's just round and open. Yeah, we'll post pictures of sloth skeletons oh, they're on so the blog cool. post. One of the other weird things they had was their their feet, and or another feature of their feet I sh- should specify, is many of them seem to have been planted grade, which is like us, walking on the flat of your foot. Mm-hmm. Some of them seem to have walk differently what they called pedolateral yes walking on the sides of their feet which if you ever watch how an orangutan walks around they walk on the edges of their feet because their feet are made for climbing and grabbing they're not made to yeah, yeah. walk so that some of them seem to have turned their feet in sideways and they're walking on the edges it's really bizarre which once again begs the question what were you doing ancestrally to yeah why do you have that why do you have those weird feet that foot shape. The reason that feet are extra interesting is that it appears many of them, if not most of them, were able to at least stand and some of them even walk bipedally. Yeah. Which is super cool. They had very robust femurs and tibia and fibula. Very, like just thick, robust. Some of them were almost rectangular. I mean, yeah. Very, very distinctive. Very distinctive. They also had much more significant tails than the modern three-toed. They had big, powerful tails. Not long, but long enough Mm -hmm. that many scientists think they were using a tripod method, like a kangaroo, where they'd be able to stand up and rest on their tail, using their legs and tail as three points to hold up their body while they used their hands, which are often formed for grasping, to feed. Yeah, grab it, branches, and mm-hmm. leaves and, so, and stuff. Very, when you think of a gorilla sitting down and pulling things down toward it. Yeah, except with giant claws. Just huge, <laughs> massive, you know, scythes, just crazy things. All of these features, and it's corroborated by the existence of trackways, that these were, at times, bipedal animals, which yeah. is cool. 
Yeah, that's super interesting because these that makes them some of the some of them are, are among the largest yes. animals to walk on two legs. Absolutely. So they these are interesting animals. They're doing unique things among mammals in general and just unique things for the kind of animal they are. And we'll get into more of those unique things as we go through some of the main families. So the first one we'll start with is the one that we still have a member living today, which is the Megalonychidae. Mm -hmm. uh, Megalonyx is the big famous member of this group, but they did have a variety. They show up about 35 million years ago, and they're cool for a couple reasons. They're early specimens, very small, which is common theme in most of the groups of ground sloths. They start out small and then eventually get big. They were also one of the first groups to make it to North America. And like I said, we'll get into the, their distribution in more detail later, but this is unique. It's them and the uh, group called the Mylodontids mm -hmm. that were the first two to make it to North America. And they showed up about 9 million years ago here in Florida. Yeah. And so one of the first ones to seize over here and those early specimens, some of them even show signs of being tree dwelling or partially tree dwelling. Interesting. Just like the modern mm -hmm. Jalipus. Yeah. Once again, these probably weren't hanging, but they may have been climbing more like a bear or ape. And even if they were just doing it when they were smaller, but it's, it's just cool that they still had a variety of ways to get around. This is also the group that I believe, unless it's been updated, that the gray fossil site ground sloth is hypothesized to be from. At least that's what I found in... Interesting. Yeah, I don't remember. Off the top of my head. When I was able to find our documents, it, it the uh, our Wikipedia article says unknown, but the more recent <laughs> one that came out a few years ago had it as Megalonychidae. Interesting. Up in Tennessee. That's in Tennessee. And this one, Five once again, ago. was fairly small. It was just... It, like, if it stood up, probably just a little bit taller than average person it was it didn't wasn't supposed to be a big yeah. one which is still big yeah that's still, a big animal that's still but yeah that's not a giant decent size there was also some that made it into islands the uh you'll hear them called the uh west indian island sloths or the caribbean pylosis mm -hmm. and some of these were very small some of them getting like large cat and once again probably arboreal with a lot of their features but we were getting some small island slots as well. It's lots of cool variety. The famous one, and probably one of the most famous of all the giant ground sloths, is me Megalonyx, but not just Megalonyx, but uh, Jeffersonii. Yeah, Megalonyx Jeffersonii is probably one of the most famous place to see animals, period. Absolutely. This is... Not only is it huge, mm -hmm. right, and it's fame. You know, obviously, its name refers to its giant claws. Yep. But it's named after the president who seems to have discovered it. Yes. <laughs> How cool! That that is an animal that was named by one of our founding fathers here in the United States. It's a cool story. So, Thomas Jefferson, who at the time when he did the naming was vice president, was presented with uh, some fossils, and he actually described them. Like, he actually published on them, which is really, I mean, like, he went through the full process. He didn't just slap a name. He published and presented. Uh, but he named it after the giant claw, which is what Megalonyx means. But initially, he thought it was a giant lion claw, which is mm -hmm. not too weird, because they didn't know giant sloths were a thing, so... It was. Yeah. It looks. It does look a lot like a big, you know, predator claw. And the really interesting part is that he actually thought it was probably still out there. Yeah. Well, naturally, mm -hmm. that that was a thought of a lot of explorers and Absolutely. fossil hunters back in the day, especially you know when the American West was unexplored. Mm -hmm. that this must still be out there somewhere. Absolutely. I mean, it's it's the same. And you can see this when you look at old movies. But when Africa was being explored for the first time by white people. Yeah, <laughs> same sort of things of what might be out there. Stories of hundred foot snakes and all that stuff. You know, yeah, it was unknown. So, but he thought it to such a degree, and I love this. He actually both cautioned, but also encouraged Lewis and Clark to keep their eyes out for it when they went yes. out west and <laughs> and asked them that if they got the chance to collect a specimen, so that yeah, he could 
boost his bolster his research, which I love. Jefferson was a cool guy. I, I, and I also love the idea that whilst exploring the Midwest, Lewis and Clark had on their, even just in the back of their mind, checklist of like, all right, you know, get water, keep rations, you know, make sure we're going the right direction, keep eye out for giant lion. <laughs> <You know? laughs> but, just, but that was just in the back just, of their head. As they lay down to sleep, yep. images of that claw <laughs> that Jefferson showed them. Just, I would love if they had a midnight routine of like, all right, who's on lion watch? Are you on lion <laughs> 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 Who's staying up first? So that's probably one of the most famous, but the next group has some of the other extremely famous giant sloths, and this is due to their size. Mm -hmm. The Megatheridae have some of the yes. biggest sloths, and not just sloths, but mammals. These are huge. Yeah. Big ma animals. Now, they show up about 30 million years ago. Uh, they also started out smaller, but got big. And now they showed up in North America as well. So you'll find you hear about them here. You'll see them in our museums very often. But they're much more recent than the megalonics. They only show up, you know, just over two million years ago. Yeah, most South American weird animals that were isolated didn't show up here until North and South America finally connected in an event that is worthy of its own episode. And we'll touch on that at the end. And that yeah. that can be a a spoiler or no a teaser. That's what I mean. A teaser for. That future episode. <laughs> yes. It can't be a spoiler. It could have already happened. <laughs> <laughs> In this group, we have the Megatherium, which means giant beast. Yes, the great beast Megatherium. Because these were huge. So Megalonyx was about 10 feet long over a ton. Big. Mm -hmm. These were about 20 feet long and pushing about four tons. Yes, like a grizzly versus a rhino. It's huge. In terms of size. And so, as I mentioned, this is not just big for a sloth. This is one of the largest animals, mammals, to have ever walked the surface of the Earth. Yeah, yeah. That's about as big as mammals get yep. that aren't elephants and other proboscideans, yes. for the most part. Yeah, but my favorite thing about them being so big is that you have to remember all the things we've already mentioned about mm -hmm. sloths. They were still probably able to be bipedal, even if they were just sitting. That's yeah. on their butt. Their head's 20 feet up in the air. <laughs> <laughs> they still had these massive claws with powerful, you know, mobile forelimbs to grab at stuff and move stuff. They actually have something interesting with those forelimbs, which has given rise to an interesting hypothesis about their diet. This is not a, a highly supported thought, but it mm -hmm. is out there, and if you look up Megatherium, you will hear about it you know, pretty easily, so want to cover it here. Due to certain features in their arm bones, it appears that their arms were specialized more for speed of movement than strength. Yeah. Which is not what you would expect with an herbivore pulling branches and foliage toward them to eat. If this was a plant eater, they'd want to be able to manhandle the plants. <laughs> the feature that they saw in those front arms are similar to carnivores that are using their forelimbs to swipe at prey. Right, right. Which has led to the idea that Megatherium may have had, if not a carnivorous diet, carnivorous tendencies. That it may have been st stealing kills is the common thing they suggest chasing mm -hmm. off other predators to steal the carrion. An interesting one, which even if it's completely not true, it's I like the mental image just from my, <laughs> is that they may have used it to flip glyptodons <laughs> and get to their soft underbelly. Just glyptodon on the half shell. Okay, interesting. I have I have many thoughts about this. Yes. Hypothesis. The predominantly two I guess that that immediately come to mind. Mm -hmm. One is if they were using, if they were carnivorous, but they were stealing kills, then they wouldn't need their arms to be swipey killy arms mm -hmm. if they were scavenging. Also, uh, I, it, as, as fun as it is to jump into the predator use for those active arms, if that is in fact what they're seeing, right? Obviously yeah. this is 
a hypothesis that has been proposed. I would wonder if that is involved in sexual display. Yes, which makes a lot of sense. In mating competition. Mm-hmm. In giant megatherium battles. Boxing matches. Echoing across the... Oh, that'd be so cool. The North American landscape. That's... That's... <laughs> Uh, it, worth the ticket of admission. Yes, let them fight. Yes, and so as it, this is not a highly su- supported hypothesis, it also is, um, yeah, contradicted by the evidence that they don't seem to have the dentition for meat eating. Yeah, now, that doesn't always stop animals. There's deers and plenty of other herbivorous animals that will go after meat when given the chance. Mm-hmm. But they also don't see any bone fragments or anything relating to, you know, any evidence for a meat-eating diet in droppings. Yes. So, as is always the case, animals are going to eat what they are able to eat when they get the chance. Yeah, it can be really hard to pin down exact diet, and it, it's really, really difficult to try to say this is an animal that mostly ate this, but then sometimes also ate this. Because yeah. if it's a sometimes food, mm-hmm. you're not necessarily going to see the adaptations Absolutely. for that. Absolutely. Well, it's, you know, the thing that we have to remember is even if you are made to eat something, the environment doesn't care. So <laughs> if your environment changes or if you get pushed to the edge of your environment, you know, if you are made for eating foliage, but then you get pushed to the coast, well, now you either have to start eating you know, crabs or finding seaweed or algae to eat. You have to eat yeah. something. It's eat or die. So you may yeah. not be designed for it, but you are able to survive off of it. So you eat it. Yes. And adaptations come after yes. the habit change. Yes, absolutely. So, yeah, it can be t- it can be a really tough question. Mm-hmm. Uh, so before we move on, this was not the only big member. You got also get the Eremotherium, which was just slightly smaller than Megatherium. Yeah. Unique in this group because it's thought that it may have had osteoderms. Yeah. These wouldn't have been, when you think of, I think the the first image that comes to mind when you think of giant ground sloths with osteoderms is, in my head, I'm imagining the silver samurai. Yes, that's exactly, a samurai armor. armor. The Wolverine. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Absolutely. But these were sort of, you know, scattered throughout the skin and they wouldn't have been like, plate armor. Yeah, you probably wouldn't have been able to see them. They were probably within the skin itself. Yeah. So it was very different. We'll go over that in a little more because we there's a group that was known for these mm-hmm. much more commonly. But before we get to them, we're going to get to one of my favorite groups of sloth, which is the Nothrotheridae. Yes. Which are smaller sloths by comparison. These were, Mm -hmm. for the most part, much lighter in size than their relatives. They they were previously placed among the megatherids. Mm -hmm. Uh, They're now in their own group. Plenty of variety among them, but they are famous for having a group with a really unique lifestyle. Thalassocnus was a group of sloths that, as far as we can tell from all of their features and the evidence of their where they're found were aquatic. Aquatic sloths. Yeah. Either semi-aquatic or fully aquatic on some of them. Water sloths. Which is so cool. Now, we've already learned that modern sloths can swim, but these were coastal sloths. Yeah. They were found on the coast of South America, and their fossils were found in the same layers as whale, dolphin, and seabird fossils. (laughs) So these were ocean, you know, these, these were marine if not swimming out in the open water, at least along the coast. Yeah. They have a number of features that makes scientists, you know, think this is the case. Dense bones, classic mm-hmm. feature of aquatic mammals. It helps fight buoyancy so that you don't have to swim downward. You yep. know, it's the same reason when you're at the pool, it's hard to get stuff off the bottom because you have to be swimming down the whole time because we float really well. Yeah. You see that bone structure in hippos, mm-hmm. uh, also in penguins. Manatees. And- Spinosaurus. Yep, that's yep. the reason we were talking before mm-hmm. about Spinosaurus. Absolutely. They also had strong forelimbs mm-hmm. and longer shin bones, which would have provided for better, you know, doggy paddling. Yeah. And swimming. In one of the initial papers, uh, I, I did a report on these animals 
back when I was in school, one of the initial papers made the observation also that many of the specimens had broken leg bones, but none of them had, uh, that had healed, broken and healed leg bones, but none of them showed that evidence in the forelimbs, in the arms. Interesting. And the reason this was potential evidence for swimming is that if you're swimming around to pull yourself out of the water, you need your front arms to be good, especially if you're in the coast where there's surf that can bash you up against rocks and do stuff like that. Yeah. You can survive a leg break because you can still pull yourself out of the water and that can heal. But if a front mm. arm breaks, then you're you're going to drown. You can't pull yourself out of the water with only back legs. Interesting. Yeah. We should find that study and we'll put it in the blog post. Oh, yes. I'll look for blog it. Post. They also had small cervical neck vertebrae. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't have provided a lot of strength for holding the head up and moving it around. But that's not necessary if you're in the gravity-defying medium of water. Yes. If water's holding your body up, you don't need to be holding your head up actively and stretching your neck out because the water's going to help you do it. And that's another feature of aquatic life. They also they have these really long faces as well, and they think that that was them grazing on underwater plants. And so as far as everything is showed, they had um the last thing. This is a weird one. They don't know for sure that this was related to swimming, but it's definitely notable is they had uh, very muscular tails. Similar musculature from the evidence to things like prehensile tails as well. So it's not positive that they were swimming with their tails. So we can't yeah. picture otter you know, sloths quite yet. But they had a lot of interesting features. Um, not that big, slightly bigger than a person. And swimming around the coast of South America. This description sounds like a sloth version of a marine iguana. Right? Absolutely. An animal that, by all accounts, does not belong here. Mm-hmm. Swimming to the bottom, chomping algae off of rocks, and then swimming back up. And just taking a nap on some rocks. Weird. <laughs> it's really cool. Really fascinating sloths. So the, the last sloths that we want to cover is uh, the mylodontids. Mm-hmm. Now, this is actually includes a couple of a few families the mylodontidae and there's a couple others that i'm honestly not going to try to name i was going to say that them. is the correct approach because both of those are stupid <laughs> just mylodontidae there's diversity uh, and they had a couple of other families all sharing certain features these have two interesting traits that stand out about them that are really cool the first one that we already hinted at are osteoderms mm -hmm. a number of different sloths in these groups have been preserved. Their skin actually has been preserved. We do have mummified sloths with preserved skin. And in this skin, in certain sloths, they have small bones embedded throughout the skin. Mm -hmm. Now, like we said, it's not like an armadillo. We've both gotten to see sloth osteoderms up close. Yeah. They look like rocks. Oh yeah. No, they're just these chunk... Just lumpy. Bones. Mm -hmm. And so... This was much more, instead of having the armor plating like an armadillo or the scale mail of a crocodile, this was very much like just loose chain link armored throughout the skin. Yeah, like pebbles in the skin. Yeah, just giving them a toughness, you know, not really organized. Finding them a separate from the animals, very hard to identify them well. Yeah. Because they are very indistinguishable in their shape. We also been able to see that the the colors they they have um yellows and reds in there for actually in the preserved ones. Interesting. Which is yeah, very interesting coloration. It's always neat when you get to find out they're not the matte brown that most yeah, brown displays. And grays. <laughs> yep. But the most interesting thing about the mylodontids is their one of their lifestyles that we've found evidence for. So they had big claws, mobile forearms, same as all your other sloths, but their forearms were particularly robust, you know, mm -hmm. very notable in their feature, and they had claws that were wide, not quite as curved, and fairly flat. They yeah. weren't your typical hooked claws that the other ones have. And this suite of features, for anybody out there who, budding anatomists, mm -hmm. right? very big, powerful forearms mm -hmm. with flat claws... This, this, we see this over and over again, convergently in different groups of animals. 
Yep, and that is typical signs of a digger. Yes, this these are big mole sloths. Because they are like me. They are a digger. <laughs> <laughs> these are underground sloths. And the evidence that backs up this is that burrows have been found in Argentina mm -hmm. that have been attributed to these sloths because the marks on the walls match the claws. And yeah. it's in areas where these sloths lived. And these are not them, like, just digging for tubers and then moving on and digging another. They have found burrows that are, for the largest ones, a meter wide, mm -hmm. two meters tall. So most of us would be able to comfortably stand up in these burrows yep. and wave, you know, have your elbows out with plenty of space. And the longest one was 20 meters long. Yes, this, this, we may, I don't remember if we mentioned this in an earlier episode in terms of news. Mm -hmm. There was a bit of research that came out earlier this year on this prevalence of these mysterious giant burrows oh, right. through South America. Mm -hmm. And some of them are, at, you know, two meters high or more. Mm -hmm. And yeah, with these scratch marks on yeah. the walls, and they have been attributed, especially the big ones, there was that big question of what could have made these because there was nothing else big enough. Yes, the exactly. only animals big enough to have made these who had somewhat digging capable yeah. forearms are giant ground sloths. The correct equipment, which is just like if you thought having a mole problem. <laughs> it was, was a nuisance just having ground slots literally in your ground well it's incredible to see the images of these tunnels because mm -hmm. they are just big tunnels big smooth tu it's like it, watching uh some sci-fi movie where there's some sort of creature that's yeah, burrowing yeah, yeah, yeah. out these tunnels you see these researchers standing up perfectly comfortable in these r round tubes in the yeah. in the rock Typically, the biggest thing that you have to be worrying about being under your ground is a groundhog or something. <laughs> I mean, something that's smaller than your cat, you know? Yeah. So this is a huge step up in size, which is awesome. Yeah, these these are very interesting, very fascinating creatures. Very cool things. Now, before, wanted to wrap up with just mentioning, because we alluded to it, sloths did end up here in North America, but they got here in a couple of different ways. Mm -hmm. Some of the earliest ones, uh, some of the Mylodontid and uh, Megalonychids, came here before there was a land bridge for them to cross. Yeah, so around that sort of three million year mm -hmm. ago time period was when North and South America, separated since the Cretaceous or so, yep. finally connected, right? That, that isthmus that connects North and South yeah, America today. The isthmus today. of Panama. The isthmus of Panama occurred right around the beginning of the Pleistocene, the the Ice Age. And there you get the, the Great American Biotic Interchange. Uh, just one of the most fascinating events in Earth history. Where And, and so it, that's a huge event. Tons of animals migrated both north and south. Oh, yeah. You got your North American fauna in my South America. You got your South American fauna in my North America. <laughs> <laughs> Reese's. Uh, <laughs> that's when most of the slots came over, but easily almost 7 million years before that. Yeah. A few slots made it over. And one of the main conclusions is that they had to be island hopping between the two yes. land masses. Now this could be done a couple of ways. One of the classic solutions for how animals get from island to island, as we mentioned in our islands episode is rafting where you are, cast adrift on a piece of foliage. Yeah, episode four. And you move to another island that way. But since we've already mentioned that there were aquatic sloths, it is also been positive that some of them may have just been swimming between the islands. Yeah. Or even if they were coastal, it's more likely that they're gonna be pulled over there. Yeah. If you get swept out in a storm when you're on the coast one day, then you may be able to just swim the rest of the way. Yeah. You know. It it happened, you know, there's other animals that that happens with all the time where if you get cast out to sea, it's swim or die. So mm -hmm. you might as well try. And so, but somehow these early adopters got 
to North America way before anyone else. And it's uh, a very interesting question as to how they got here so quickly. Yeah, they were the pioneers of the interchange. Yeah, which is... I don't know if there were animals that that we see that the other direction with. If there were particular North American species that were making it to South I America. I feel like I read... Uh, yes, I did. I, I, when I was reading up about it, um, rodents. Oh, yeah, that makes sense. That was that was evidently one of the big ones that first did it in the other direction. And, of course, they did. Yeah, well, yeah, rodents. <laughs> yeah. Makes sense. <laughs> what, there's land over there, too? <laughs> I don't live there yet. <laughs> Let's get it. <laughs> Zerg rush South America. So, that's sloths. Now, that is sloths. by no means everything to be said about them. They're fascinating animals. There's tons of cool things about, like, how the aquatic ones transition to a aquatic lifestyle and oh yeah you know we didn't even go into much detail about the evidence for the arboreal ones but there's tons of different ones that show potential signs of that so it's mm -hmm. lots of cool stuff lots of interesting things uh it's another one of those animals where we don't really have a good direct parallel to it today yeah th this is one of those groups that it what's really fascinating is they're hard to make predictions about because mm -hmm. we really don't have much like them today but there are other animals in earth history that are similar to sloths yes yes which is always really fun like the therizinosaurs yes mm -hmm. are dinosaurs who are very similar in body shape to sloths and that's super fun because it always means you know you look at them and you go oh, well maybe they were living like sloths what does that mean? I don't oh. know, because we don't know what they were living like. <laughs> if you take a bear, you mix it with a rhino, and you mix it with a can Freddy opener. <laughs> <laughs> with a Swiss army knife. <laughs> it's, it's, you basically got a sloth. <laughs> and so it's, yeah, it's it's really hard to, you know, because it's, like you said, when the child care came up, but also with the burrowing in the aquatic, of if I say aquatic sloth, it's like, well, that's super weird. Is it? We don't yeah, know. Who knows? We can't tell you if it's weird or not, because they're weird. We can't give you a baseline, because <laughs> they're bizarre, Yeah, and which makes them fascinating. At least several species of aquatic sloth, so mm -hmm. apparently it's not that weird. Yeah. I mean, maybe it's like, you know, because elephants can swim, and if you showed me an elephant, I'd be like, all right, well, don't put it in the water, because it's going <laughs> to obviously sink to the bottom Yeah. and put a hole in the bottom, because, I mean... That it's that thing's rectangular, <laughs> <laughs> so it's it's weird stuff. Indeed, they are a fascinating group of animals. We will have lots of cool pictures on the blog post Absolutely. as usual, so that you can relish their strangeness. Yes, they they are super fun. I had fun with this one. As usual, as we wrap up our episode, we encourage all of you to make contact with us. You can take your time. There's no rush. As the, in honor of this episode, you can take it nice and easy. <laughs> <laughs> we would love to hear from you all. Let us know if there's anything that from this episode you'd like to hear more about. If there's any other subjects that you are eager to hear us go on and on, we can. You can contact us through Facebook, Twitter, iTunes, Gmail, mm -hmm. Podbean. Yeah, all that good stuff. I don't know if Stitcher has a. I think we've. I don't know. Wondered that Anywhere before. you find us, wherever yeah. you, however you came across us, uh, Patreon. Join us on Patreon if yes, you please would. Do. We love the support we get from our patrons. Mm -hmm. Another big thanks to Ian for this suggestion. Absolutely, this was a fun whose one. suggestion was, of course, if I remember right, specifically ground sloths. Mm -hmm. But as we discussed, ground sloths are pretty yes. much all the good sloths. <laughs> they all. They all. <laughs> End up there at some point, you know. <laughs> don't don't we all? Yeah, once a don't week. We all? The <laughs> tree slots are ground slots. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks again for listening, everyone. Join us on New Year's Eve. Yeah, will be the final episode of the Common Descent Podcast for 2017. It's pretty crazy. Episode 25, one fortnight from the release of this episode where we will discuss something else. Yeah. Thanks again for hanging out with us, everyone. 
Hope join you enjoy. us next time. And I'm going to end the episode with the comment that I should have started the episode with, <laughs> and I forgot to. And that is, hey, you guys. <laughs> and and <cut. laughs> that's a wrap, everyone. We got it. <laughs>